Great. So some signposts along our way. First, a brief introduction to closure, and then uh, hopefully provide some motivation on why I would actually want to do something without JDBC. And then take a look at Zoe, the client that I've been working on. If you have any questions as we go by, I will be moving uh, relatively fast, but feel free to pipe up or raise your hand, and I'll, I'll look to, to answer the questions as we go. So, closure. How many people have had any exposure to closure, or using it, or have played around with it, or at least have heard of it? Great. Well, <clears throat> let's just jump right in and take a look at some closure. Here are some, uh, in particular, these are some closure data structures. The first is a, a vector of three strings. And the next one is a map. And we're using keywords for the keys of this map, though uh, this is very common for closure developers to use. But keys and objects in, uh, and values in a map can be of any type. For example, the next, uh, the next map we have here, the keys are vectors. And here I'm using them to represent schema qualified type names, and they're mapping them to the OID. In the, from the PG type table. And how might a closure developer actually use these data structures? Well, here I have a vector that I'm going to represent as a, the series of Postgres con, um, conference talks. Each of those talks is represented as a map. Of course, there are so many talks, and there's a lot of data here. I've elided most of those. And little fun fact, commas are considered white space in closure. And there's a convention to use three commas like this um, to to show elision and still be syntactically valid. Kind of a nice thing to have. Um, and even this, for the examples I've got, the description is really long, so I'm just going to omit that in my summaries. But um, imagine that it's still there. So one of the features of Postgres that I'm particularly interested in right now is um, logical decoding and logical replication. So I want to take a look at the talks that, um, that have logical in their description. So here I'm creating a simple function that takes one of those talk maps, um, takes out the description, and does a regex find for logical in that description. It'll return a truthy value if it finds the um, logical there and falsy otherwise. So I can filter the talks um, using this predicate function. And you can see that we've got five talks at PGCon that have logical in the description. And <clears throat> of course, um, these are in just some random order. so. I want to put them in order so it makes it easier for me to arrange my schedule. So I can pass the output of the filter function as an argument to sort by, and this sorts them by the at, um, at value of those maps. And as is often the case, once you start drilling into the data, you realize, oh, there's even more I want to do. So uh, I can keep on passing the result of one function call as an argument to another, but that can get really tedious to keep on um, both to write and to read, trying to go work backwards. Uh, so Clojure provides some al alternatives in how to write that. For example, using threading. Here, talks is being passed to filter logical, which is being passed to this sort by. And if I stopped right there, that's exactly the same as the first expression above. But again, what I want to figure out, well, how much travel time, when do I need to leave to make sure I attend the very first talk? So I pass the results of that to first. It gives me the first talk. Then I grab the um, at value of that. And then I have a function that calculates my travel time and adds that to this. All of this, other than the logical function and the add travel time, those are uh, parts of um, the core, Postgres or core closure functionality. Closure makes it really easy to do a lot of data processing like this. And <clears throat> I, I like my type checking like I like my superheroes, dynamic and strong. In, closure is dynamically typed. I don't need to um, give my, uh, identify my types in the code. Um, and types are not checked at compile time. But closure is strongly typed. Uh, types are checked at runtime. And many of the features of closure actually does dispatch on the types of the values. That said, closure developers will often use these basic data structures rather than instantiate specific classes to group um, types together. Uh, they'll often use maps with keys identifying fields rather than creating a, um, an instance of something. And this is actually kind of a, a superpower itself. Bruce Lee famously said, I fear not the man who practices 10,000 kicks once. I fear the man who has practices one kick 10,000 times. So as you become very familiar with a, a few core data structures, a closure developer <coughs> very easily is able to process lots of different, uh, lots of different data in many different ways. Alan Perlis, in his epigrams of, of programming, 
said something similar when he said that it's better to have 100 functions that operate on a single data structure than 10 functions that operate on 10 data structures. Closure also makes a very clean distinction between value, identity, and state. This is something that should be really familiar to us as database developers. We refer to tables, for example, by name, even though the number of rows in that table or the values of the columns of that table may change over time, we know what we mean when we refer to the user's table, for example. And as I mentioned, the number of rows and the values of, in the um, rows can change. That's the state changing over time. If you take a query on that table, you get a consistent snapshot of the query when you, um, when you execute it. Even if the table gets changed after that query is made, the result you got stays the same. That's a value from that snapshot. It's really important in, in Postgres, of course. There's a lot of work being done to make sure that those snapshots you get are consistent and efficient. And of course, Postgres uses MVCC to do that, multi-version concurrency control. Closure also uses multi-version concurrency control. Um, to make sure that you have consistent snapshots of data that may be shared between different parts of your application. The implementation is quite a bit different. In particular, Clojure uses something called persistent data structures. Um, and Chris Okazaki's 1996 PhD thesis, Purely Functional Data Structures, um, is a really interesting read and was really influential in making these, uh, popularizing these in the use of functional programming. Phil Bagwell, while at the Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, Switzerland, um, built upon that work and created something called array mapped, array, hashed array map trees, or some common, combination of that. And that, um, those features there provide the implementation of persistent data structures in Clojure. And this <coughs> actually is one of the reasons that I really like Clojure. And one of the things that's appealed to me about uh, with Postgres over the years that I've been, involved, been using it, both Clojure and Postgres are built on these really rigorous academic foundations, but they make a very practical and versatile tool. Uh, if you look at Postgres's history, if you're reading the source code, there are references to Knuth all over the place. Uh, also, you th think of Kevin Gritner working with Matt Dan Ports at MIT to implement um, serialized snapshot isolation. All of this rigor gives me the confidence that the, the tools are going to behave consistently and um, over time. That gives me a lot of confidence. And Clojure gives me that as well. Another, <coughs> another um, feature that's very practical with Clojure is its Java interop. Clojure is hosted on the JVM, but it doesn't try to abstract away the underlying platform. It makes it really simple to use Java directly. For example, here I've got a Java util date instance constructor. I'm assigning the, that instance to the var now. And any of the uh, methods that you might expect uh, to work on a Java util instance, for example, get time, will work just as, you, as expected. That's the number of milliseconds since unique epoch. Similarly, class methods or um, constants, all of this is immediately available in Clojure. <coughs> this gave Clojure a fantastic advantage as soon as it was released. Uh, you didn't need to wait for uh, all of the libraries that were already available for Java were instantly available to Clojure as well. For example, if you were doing natural language processing, you didn't need to wait for a native Clojure library. You could just use Stanford Core NLP. And if you want to use a SQL database, you can use JDBC right out of the box. You want to use Postgres? We've got a great community driver, the PGG, PG JDBC driver. So, <coughs> uh, Let's take a quick look at what JDBC looks like, first in Java. Here, I'm importing the um, Java SQL package. I've got a connection string. I build a connection from that. I have a SQL string. I create a statement with that SQL string. I bind a value to it. I execute the query, and I get back a result set. And this is a Java SQL result set that I get back. I can do the same thing with Clojure, just using the Java interop. Um, remember, Clojure is dynamically typed, so I only need to import the thing that I'm actually going to refer to by name, the driver manager here. Again, I've got the same SQL uh, connection, or connection URL, create a connection, I've got a SQL string, the statement, there's some nicety here, I can do that all in one expression, with the binding and the statement creation. I execute the query, and again, I'm going to get back a Java SQL result set. But um, it, this isn't really idiomatic closure, though, and it's not uncommon for a, um, closure developers to create packages that wrap these Java libraries to make it a little easier to use. 
For example, the Clojure Java JDBC library is a really good example. Shad Corfield has made a, a, been maintaining a fantastic package. To take a look at how that's used, um, here we require the Java JDBC library. Uh, notice here, instead of the, an opaque um, UR connection string, it's actually broken down into a, a simple map with the connection parameters. We've got a SQL string. And look at where we're actually calling the query. Here we have a data structure that represents the query and the parameters we want to pass to it. Um, and with the connection parameters, we call the query. And what we get back is one of these basic uh, closure data structures. In this case, it's a sequence with a map containing the row that's being returned. Um, a closure developer can act on this directly. They don't need to look up the Java doc to figure out how to iterate, for example, over a result set. So I'm using Clojure. I've got great Java interop. I've got a great database system with, um, with Postgres and can even a nice Clojure wrapper to make that really idiomatic. So why can't I get no satisfaction? What is my problem? <coughs> well, the, um, if you just want a good SQL implementation, Postgres is great for that. And Java JDBC um, the, and the Postgres uh, driver, the Clojure package around that, if all you want is SQL, this is a great package. However, how many of us like Postgres for more than just SQL? There's fantastic types. It's got all of these other features associated with, it, with that. And that's one of the reasons that I choose Postgres. One of the tools around that, for example, is libpq, the C client library. Anything that implements libpq automatically gets access to all of the environment connection parameters, the um, PG pass file, the service file, which, my goodness, once I realized how to use that, you can have connection, um, collections of connection parameters and refer to those by name. Fantastic. Uh, and uh, you can define all of your connection information in one place. If you're using PSQL or Ruby or Python or Perl, um, all of that stuff I, is only defined once. Fantastic. Yay, I'm on the JVM. I don't use the C client library. And, I, I really don't like having to define my connection parameters one more time. It's one more thing to, for me to forget to update. So in a fit of peak and frustration, I finally realized, oh, I don't need to implement a complete client. Java can read the environment just as well as C can. So I've created a small library in the Unix tradition of trying to do one thing and do it the best I can. And I created the peak library. And it returns two functions. Uh, it provides two functions, one of which returns the environment parameters. It reads the same files um, as libpq does and pr provides them in a libpq flavor. And also, I do want to use it with the JDBC stuff. So it, um, the JDB, JDBC spec function return, includes the DB type. And there's some spelling differences with some of the parameters. So hey, isn't nice small wins? It's amazing how these can make your life easier. <clears throat> but let's take a step back and think of why we're using an, a database in the first place. You might uh, be using it for, as a common integration point for applications. Maybe you really like the analytics and the reporting that's um, available in SQL or in your database system. Uh, but it really all comes down to the data, right? Uh, and you want to make sure that that data is all consistent. And if you're using something like Smalltalk, it, um, your database is most likely going to be some kind of object store. The data that's in your object store is going to be the same types of data that you've got in your application. Another example of, of this would be maybe if you're using Node.js with MongoDB. The types in your um, data store are the same types that you've got in your application. If you're using PSQL or if you're using Postgres, unless you're actually in Postgres itself, the types in, um, in your database are, are likely going to have some mismatch with the types in your application. right? So, and this isn't the object relational mismatch that people often talk about, where you're mapping classes to, um, for example, database tables. These are the concrete types, uh, for example, in PG type. In Java, um, some of the types, the shorts, integers, and longs, they map very nicely to Postgres's int2, int4, and int8. Um, you, it's very easy to encode those and decode those pretty much just verbatim from one, one system to the other. Other types are a little more complex, for example, date times. Postgres has great date time support and has for years. Java has been a little bit more frustrating. Um, Java util date was an example we saw so far. That is not really a great um, system to be using if you want to do any kind of, actually any kind of date manipulation. 
Um, and the Jota Time Library became very popular because it had a lot of great facilities for that. And the Jota Time Library strongly influenced the Java Time package that was included recently in Java 8. So let's take a look at Java, um, Java Time Instant Offset Date Time. Both of these um, are great representations in Postgres as timestamp TZ. Uh, if you have a Postgres timestamp TZ value, well, which one are you going to decode that to? It really depends on your application and what you're going to use. If you're using Java JDBC, you're going to, um, the way that you do this is you go from your Java instant for, um, to JDBC Java SQL timestamp and then back. You have to do this um, encoding and decoding through this um, inter intermediary type. And remember back at the beginning where I was talking about how Clojure developers will use a few key data structures to represent a lot of different data? Well, how are we going to switch on type for that? For example, cl the closure maps we were looking at. In Postgres, we've got a number of types, HStore, JSON, the point, even points that we may end up representing in maps in closure. But if we've got a closure map, there's really not a lot of information there for us to decide on how we're going to in encode that in, in Postgres. And if, for example, the community JDBC driver, when it sees a Java map, it'll try to encode that as HStore. But this was before Postgres had good JSON support and before JSON was so popular. But now with the rise in popularity with JSON, it probably makes sense to encode closure maps as JSON. Make sense? So how does all this encoding and decoding happen anyway? Well, Postgres has the version 3 protocol, which describes all of the messages that can go between the client backend. I got that wrong, didn't I? The server backend and the client front end. Um, and it describes all of the valid messages, and um, this is actually almost 15 years old now. It was released with Postgres 7.4 uh, back in 2003. Um, and there's a lot of facility there. And one, uh, I was surprised how much there was there when I started digging into it. If you take a SQL query, for example, the one at the top, you can see that I've got two parameters, and I've got, I'm returning three columns. I can pass this query to the back end and ask, um, ask Postgres, to, uh, to parse it and give me an e examples of what it's expecting for those parameter types and what it's actually going to be returning to me. For example, um, from the, when I ask Postgres to parse this query, it tells me that it, the parameters it's ex ex expect, expecting are types um, 25 and 26. These are the OIDs that correspond to the types in the PG type table. 25 is text and 26 is OID, which makes sense given the query that we've got above. We also get back a row description. And if we take a look at the first, uh, the first field there, you can see that it returns the, the name of the field, OID. It also returns the type ID, which is 26. Again, OID, which is what we would expect. But there's a lot of other information there as well. I was surprised to learn that it also provides the at rel ID and at number. This is the column where that data was actually sourced from Postgres. And here, at rel, if Postgres can determine which column it was, it'll provide this information. At rel ID is the PG type table. That's the OID for the PG type table. And at num minus 2 is the OID column in that table. Taking a look at the second field there, we're returning the type namespace column. And in the, notice in, this, um, in the query, we're casting that to reg namespace. And that's the type ID. For, uh, 4089 is the reg namespace type. But notice the at rel ID and at number are both 0. We've done this cast, so the column that's being returned no longer corresponds to the underlying um, column in the table, so Postgres doesn't provide that information. Um, again, with the third column, it's returning type name. Type ID is 19, which corresponds to the name data type in Postgres. And at rel ID is, again, 1247 at the PG type table. And at num is 1, because type name is the first column in the PG type table. So we actually have a lot of information available to us. If we want to choose our encoding, we can look at the closure value we've got. We can also look at the parameter types that Postgres is expecting. If we're doing decoding, there's a lot more information that I even knew was available to be able to decide how we're going to decode that. And again, one of the things I love about Postgres are, is the um, extensive type support that it has. A lot of it's already built in. For example, JSON, which has really become the uh, lingua franca and uh, I think um, definitely helped with Postgres's popularity rise recently. And so, of course, let's take a look at how we might um, you translate uh, closure maps to JSON. Here I've got a simple <coughs> closure map, two uh, 
with two values. The second one is actually a vector. And I'm just going to try to round trip that. And you can see when I try that, I get an exception. And the first time I saw this exception, I was thinking, well, I've got a closure map. I'm casting it to JSON. What does HDOR have to do with any of this? Um, at that point, I wasn't even, I had kind of forgotten we even had an HDOR type. And what's happening there is remember, the community driver will look at a, a Java map and try to encode that as, uh, as HDOR. And closure maps implement Java's map interface. So the, the community driver is trying to encode that as, as HDOR. I don't have that installed, and therefore that's the exception I get. So let's install HDOR. Wasn't that fast? Uh, and so I'm doing the same round trip. I don't get the exception. And I get back this PG object, because the driver doesn't know how to, how to choose the encoding back into closure. And, but it does include a lot, the PG object includes both the type information, which it says it's JSONB, and it gives me back the value. And at first glance, this looks okay. But take a look at, closer at that, the value that's associated with B. It looks almost like an array, but it's actually just a string, bracket one space two space three space close bracket. So we've lost information when we're trying to do our encoding. Well, let's try to do that serialization ourselves. I bring in the Cheshire library, which is a common JSON serialization library for closure. I pass my map and serialize that myself, pass the serialization in there to, um, and let Postgres do the uh, interpretation. No exception, I get back a PG object and look at the value. That's actually a JSON array. So just a quick comparison uh, without serialization, you can see the difference in the value of B. But again, well, let's take a look at the, at the keys. The keys are spelled differently as well. And frankly, I don't know whether I can say that one of them is wrong and one of them is right. It really depends on what your application is expecting, right? It would be nice to be able to have the choice of, of how that's going to be interpreted. User, this hasn't even um, gone back through Cheshire. So something that uh, oh, right, exactly. Yep, those are being, um, if you notice up at the serialized map, um, it's stripping the, the key, it's making the keyword strings correct. And that's actually an option in the Cheshire library. Um, and to fully do this, I would then want to pass the, um, that get value returns a string, and I would want to pass that string back to the Cheshire library. Good point. Um, but the whole point of what I would like to do is I would like to be able to ignore all of that stuff. I, wouldn't, I don't want to have to do all of, all of this kind of stuff manually. Uh, User-defined types are uh, another thing that's really nice in Postgres, it, um, to be able to define types that aren't even part of Postgres natively. And PostGIS is a great example of that. They've implemented a lot of C-based types that make uh, it very efficient for indexing at, or for operations on more complex data. Uh, but you don't even have to go into C to really take advantage of user-defined types. Do you have questions, Steve? OK. Um, for example, enums. I love enums. I like the additional validation that you get with them. I like the more efficient storage, and I can still have something that's readable as, as opposed to some magic number. Um, so let's create a my enum type in the Zoe schema. It's got three values, A, C, and B. Uh, and in Clojure, again, it's, rather than creating a, a separate class for this, it's common to use, use just a keyword. So let's try to round trip that. And I unsurprisingly get an exception because uh, it's Java database connectivity. It's not closure database connectivity, so it has no idea what to do with this keyword. Um, so let's kind of serialize it ourselves like we did with JSON. This name function called on a keyword will retur return a string uh, of, the, of the keyword. And I get back a Postgres object, because Postgres doesn't know how to decode an enum into closure. Um, and I can see that the type that comes back is zo my enum. So that looks pretty good. Um, this, it looks good. But there's actually a, a, a bug in the Postgres community driver where you can actually lose the schema information depending on what your order of operations are when you're using um, user-defined types. And I'm actually a big fan of namespaces. I didn't realize how important namespaces were until I really um, saw how well they were um, used in Java and um, likewise in Clojure. Namespaces are a great way to logically separate your um, code into um, logical parts. It's also, a, in, particularly in Java, you kind of get your own realm of uh, workspace that no one else is going to be creating other functions in there or stomping on your variables. Good morning, Alvaro. Good morning. Um, 
So, um, and Postgres has, actually has namespaces as well. They go by the horribly overloaded term schema. Um, and a good indication that schemas are actually meant for namespacing is the underlying Postgres table that implements schemas is called PG namespace. So I really like, even when I create an enum type, to be able to put that in its own um, namespace, its own schema, all um, my tables as well. Um, I strongly encourage you, if you don't take advantage of schemas, please start doing it. There are some times you should not be playing in public. So that's a fantastic idea. <coughs> Another feature of JDBC that frustrates me a little bit is data realization. When you do a query to, um, to the Postgres backend, each row, um, once the data starts coming back, it comes back a row at a time. And that as they come in off the wire, off the socket, the JDBC driver will decode each of those rows and it accumulates all those rows together into a result set. It, that, um, these are the Java SQL result sets that we talked about earlier. That whole result set is then handed over to your application. And that's a Java SQL result set. That's very unlikely to be the language of the domain of your own application. You're good, li very likely going to be iterating over that same thing to put it in, into the language of your application. So you end up iterating over this and realizing this data twice. It would be really, really nice to take that transform function and push it all the way down with the decoding right off of the wire where the rows are coming in. Then I only need to iterate over that data once and so it's in the language of my application. Postgres also has this fantastic async listen notify system, which I think is underutilized, partly because many of the drivers we already have out there don't do a really great job of exposing it. And it is truly async. These messages can come into your driver, um, to your clients at any time uh, um, from other clients that happen to be connected at the same time to the Postgres backend. Um, the closer community PG JDBC driver does implement listen notify. And as these messages come in, it accumulates them in an array. Um, but the way that you figure out whether or not you've got a message is that you have to keep polling the driver to see if any of those messages come, has come in. And you know you can build up your own loop that does that polling at the frequency that you want, but I would really like a more proper async interface to listen notify. So the, cri the things that I would really be looking for in a driver are the features of libpq, which I mentioned that I was already do able to take care of with, with the peak library, good user-defined types with um, good namespace support. I really only want to realize my data once, and I want to have an uh, idiomatic async interface with listen notify. So yeah, that's kind of why I'm not satisfied. And other people have found uh, that they would like something a little bit different as well. There's the PG JDBC NG driver, which is an alternative JDBC implementation. Um, and it provides a little better support in some of these areas. Thomas Heller and Antti Laisi both have created non-JDBC Postgres drivers in Java, and interestingly enough, both of them also provide closure wrappers for those. But if you take a look at the matrix, none of them really satisfy the criteria that I, I was looking at. I was also a little motivated to get my hands a little dirty and understand the version 3 protocol better, um, so I created the library Zo. Taking a page from the Postgres mascot, mascot Slonic, which my understanding is that means little elephant. Zo is the Japanese name for elephant. It's also a very nice short word, um, so it saves me a little bit of typing. And as far as I know, it's not um, taken by anyone else. So one more domain owned by Michael Glazman. So <coughs> we've gotten to our destination. So let's take a look at how it's going so far. So, as is very common, uh, closure developers um, can do a lot of work at what's called a REPL. It's very much like working with the PSQL interface. Here um, at this prompt at the bottom there, I am connected to a live closure backend with my libraries loaded. And I can ex um, put in expressions there. Uh, for example, let's um, add one and two and I get back the response three. Kind of nice. Um, but I actually don't do a lot of my work directly at a REPL like this. Uh, yeah, the hazards of live coding. I usually have a separate file open, and this file is actually associated with that REPL, 
and I can um, take one of these expressions and pass it to the REPL and get back the uh, results right here. So, and that's usually done with a key command. Um, so I can take that same 1 plus 2, and it's evaluated, and it's given me the result right there. I love test-driven development, for the, um, and often we'll have my files um, being watched for any changes, and they run my tests again, give me a pretty good um, uh, turnaround. This is a lot faster. Uh, and I can use any expression like that. So let's require the, the Zo library. Notice both Zo and um, Peak are still alpha. Uh, so let's require those. And remember, Peak, it should give me the um, environment variables. And there's the connection information that I've got for my Postgres connection. Let's assign those um, parameters to this conprams var. And here I'm going to actually create a connection that wraps those um, those connection parameters. This client is actually just a session factory. It holds, it hasn't created a c connection at this point, but it knows how to create connections. So um, let's actually create a session from the client. So this now has connected to the Postgres uh, instance. And uh, like being a good closure dev, I want to be able to specify my query as one of these simple data structures. So I've got a map here with a SQL key that indicates the statement that I want to send uh, to the back end. I evaluate that. I get back a result set, which is enclosed in a vector, and it's returning one map for each row that's coming back. In this case, we've got one row with one column and the value one. So a lot of ones going on here. Um, and if I need parameters to associate with that, I can add the params key with a vector of the parameters that go in, and I can evaluate that. One of the things that's really nice about this is that map is just a data structure. I can pass that around all the, uh, and modify it as I'm doing work. And then, um, then when I actually need to um, execute it, I can just pass it to the query. And um, yes, we do have things that can return um, more than one row. So here's an example of multiple maps coming back with one result set. <clears throat> one of the other things that I um, get a little bit bored with is I know that this query is going to return just a single value. I, and always unwrapping those things, and unwrap it from the result set, unwrap it from the row. So I've provided a few shortcuts for myself as well. So I know this is going to return a value. Uh, so the query form is a little bit different, but it does all that unwrapping for me. This isn't really magic. It just saves me um, some time. Similarly, I can pass in some parameters and return just a row. It unwraps it, so it returns a map. And sometimes you don't even want the column names. You just want a vector of information back. So um, row V indicates that it's going to return a vector, and that's what I get. Any questions on the data structures here so far? OK. And one of the big things for me, of course, is types. And if you, um, at the end of the day, there are three things you need if you've got a custom type. You need to know its name, because the OID can change depending on your Postgres installation. You need to know how to encode it going from closure into Postgres. And we already looked at the. Um, at this name function that will do that for us. And similarly, on the way out, um, you need a function that's going to um, decode the value that comes back from Postgres. For the enums that we were using before, I'm going to use keywords as values in closure, and I'm going to uh, use the name function and the keyword function to my, do my encoding and decoding. So I need the name of the type, the, um, a way to encode, and a way to decode. And I want to be able to do that flexibly. So I have, I'll bring in another namespace from Clojure, which has information on how to do that. And here I'm specifying the type name that's associated with that type. Here's where I'm taking, I take in a keyword, and I'm wrapping it with the name function. And here's where I'm decoding it. It's taking a string from the Postgres backend and calling um, the keyword function on that. So let's define that. And this is one of the cases where a Clojure developer may actually be using classes. This def type actually does create a Java class called Zo My Enum Codec. Um, and, but I'm not using this to encode any kind of state or data. It's a convenient way of associating these three functions together. Um, so it is a class. So to use it, I'm going to instantiate it. And here, I've got a query where I'm going to try to round trip that keyword value. I've got the keyword parameter. But I also can supply my encoders and decoders directly in the query. So the encoder vector corresponds to, I should have one encoder for each parameter that I'm passing in. And similarly, the decoders, I should have one decoder 
that for every column that I'm returning. And here, I've got one column, or one parameter, one column, and I'm using the same, uh, since I'm round tripping, I'm using the same codec. So, ta-da, keyword going in, keyword coming out. Um, but who wants to type that every time they need to specify something? So it would be nice to be able to just add this to the, um, the number of types that your clients actually know. So here I'm going to import the, the registry, which is the collection of um, encoders and decoders that the clients can know about. And I'm going to add the, these codecs as, um, as encoders and decoders. And just um, this is one of those cases where uh, that motivates why I have a connection factory. Um, so now this client knows about the connection parameters, but it also has this other registry of encoders and decoders that it has. Uh, and so let's create a session using that new, new client. So here, oh gosh, I, I have debugging information in there. This is one of the bugs that still doesn't work. So, um, but notice here I don't supply the encoders and decoders because hopefully the client already knows how to do that. And that works as well. So it looks like I've got a pretty convenient way to specify in a custom way my encoders and decoders. I also mentioned that I wanted idiomatic um, um, async listen notify. And there's a lot of different strategies for using async in a lot of different languages. Um, callbacks are one common way of doing that. Um, in Clojure, how many people have used Go or looked at Go? Um, and Go famously has Go loops, uh, which allow you to do async. And both core, Clojure core async li library and, um, and Go's Go loops are inspired by um, Tony Hoare's core uh, communicating sequential processes, another fantastic good, rigorous academic paper. Um, and the core async library, rather than using um, callbacks, has the concept of channels. And a channel is this object that you pass around, and some parts of the application can take that channel and, and push messages onto it, and other parts of the application can pull messages off of it. So it's a way of um, uh, decoupling different aspects of your um, application, but they can still communicate with each other. So that's what I'm going to use here uh, to, as the messages come into the session, it's, uh, the session will put those messages onto a channel, and I'm going to grab a channel uh, from the session and pull messages off of it as they come in asynchronously, not something that I will need to pull on. Uh, so let's create a client that's going to be listening or a session for, for listening. And this is how I get uh, access to that channel. I call the Zoe listen, um, listen function on the session. But <clears throat> there's a lot of different strategies that you might want. Anytime that you've got messages being passed and forth, back and forth, you're gonna, you might want to figure out your buffering strategies on how that's going to be doing. And by default, core async will just block. Once a message goes on something, it won't allow any more messages to be put on, on that until someone pulls it off. Um, so I'm going to create a loop here, a go loop, actually, that's going to take a channel. And every time it'll, um, at the start of the loop, It'll wait until a message comes in. It, and then here, I'm going to print that message to standard out with the, this heard prefix and whatever the message came in. And then it's just going to loop. So this will, um, this will consume messages as they come in on the channel, so it won't block. And so I actually will be able to see with my output. Most likely, you're going to do something more interesting than just print them to standard out. But this will work for the purposes of demonstration. And oh, I didn't. That's what happens when you don't require the library. Let's require the library. Let's create the listener, grab our listening channel, and print loop. Great. And so we'll call that on that channel that we've got. Um, OK. And you can see that REPL that we were connected to earlier, that's where the errors came out as well. So um, this, this is the REPL that's being connected. I still have to tell the back end what um, Postgres channels I want to listen to. So let's listen to my chan. And for fun, let's listen to my other chan as well. We need someone to be sending messages. So let's create a session that will send, um, send notifications. And let's send a notification to my chan. And you can see up uh, in standard out, we heard a message. It's process ID 23430. Um, on the channel name MyChan and the, with an empty payload. That process ID 
refers to the notifier, uh, the back end that's supporting the notifier session. And this is actually all of the information that's available that comes back from the version 3 protocol. You can do with that whatever you want. Uh, let's make sure that we can pass a payload, and you can see the payload foo comes through, and send a message on the other channel. We're listening to that as well. And what happens if we send something we're not listening to? Well, message was sent, and as expected, we didn't hear anything because we weren't listening for it. And believe me, this stuff isn't just broken. We can still listen to the things we were expecting before. So hey. So that's Zoe. And I try to get back to my slides. There are worse technical difficulties than to lose your last two slides. So, um, so am I satisfied? Well, if you remember my criteria, I wanted um, the facilities with libpq to be able to read my environment. I, I was able to get that with the peak library. I didn't need to do anything with my, um, with my, with it, actually create a client for that. Um, I wanted good namespace support with user-defined types. And you can see that it's really easy to create your encoders and decoders and, and create a session that knows how to handle those without digging into the internals of any kind of driver. I wanted to have um, good core async support um, with idiomatic async listen notify. And you can see that I got that. So in terms of the criteria that I had set up for myself, yeah, I am pretty satisfied with how things are working out. This is still very much alpha, um, and I'm still dogfooding it and making improvements to it. Um, and, but I'm pretty happy with how it's shaping up. And my name is Michael Glazman. You, if you go up to GRZM on GitHub, you can see the library that's available there and how that's going. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions. We have a few minutes left. Yeah. Pardon? So we should really change the community JDBC driver so that at least you have the option of not using HStore and mapping structures into JSON instead of directly instead of HStore entity. In, oh, indeed. And um, the only reason that I've started using, um, getting involved in, JD, in the community JDBC driver is um, to fix some of these things. I'm, I think the first time. Um, I actually looked at the code was September of last year, so I'm really a neophyte. I was happy that, um, that at Postgres Comp in Jersey City that um, Dave actually came to my talk and said, oh, these are things that we can improve. So he's very open to doing things like that as well. So, and um, very few of these limitations are actually inherent in, JDBC, in the JDBC spec. Some of them um, are like the result set realization, realizing things once. The namespace thing, that's just a bug. Um, which unfortunately has been um, bike shedded for a number of years. Um, and um, I just need to get enough people on board to review some of the patches that I've got in uh, for fixing that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of things that Dave's willing to, willing to do to improve it. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm not from Java world, so yeah. I don't know a bit what uh, in Clojure and Java, how these things can go together. But, um, I'm currently contributing to PGGDBC. Oh, okay. To help uh, PG servers by the support. Yeah, there, um, I, have, um, I saw that Sirope entered, um, started a thread on that. And um, I, I've, wanted to, uh, I've wanted to chime in a little bit more on that thread. And I haven't seen the direction it's going. But I, I think there's no reason why we can't be doing this in JDBC itself. Yes, yeah. yes, that's not the problem. Um, I think that like PGGDBC is quite heavy. Yes. Uh, and uh, for me, I'm a Python developer at the start. So mm. it's quite, quite hard to dive into. It is. And I would um, encourage you, any problems that you've got getting started, like I have a collection of notes for myself that, uh, like, where did I find this stuff? Oh, nice. So anything that you can share as well, because we, we should really improve the onboarding for that. I see that there is a PGDBC NG. Yes. So there is uh, new clients everywhere for Java developers. So I'm wondering if uh, how can you one use uh, Zo uh, when you write Java and so on? How does it fit together? What's well, um, the base choice? I can. Um, 
I'll answer this question, and, and I believe we're going to be done. But um, I, um, I can create uh, um, interfaces from, um, from Zoe, so you could call that from Java. Um, I haven't created that yet. I'm unsure whether or not there would be a lot of benefit from doing that, um, just because it is really specific to trying to make the closure experiences well. And as you can see, there, there, the what the what people expect from Java and what people expect from Closure can be quite so different. I guess you didn't have the lot of coverage on the questions. No. Oh, uh, um, to be honest, what you saw up there is pretty much all Zoe does right now. So no, I don't have any coverage for previous versions. So, and which is also a benefit, right? I don't. Um, the JDBC driver has an expectation that it'll go back and support things that have been around for many, many years. I don't envy that, and um, I am very happy to say no. Um, um, Postgres 10, and if it happens to work earlier, great. And if it doesn't, you know, that's yeah, exactly, exactly. So. Right, exactly. So, thank you very, very much. Thanks for.